Good morning, church. It was specifically mentioned to me when I preach here to dress up in a Hawaiian shirt. But being of Dutch background, I'm a bit rebellious, so I bucked that trend. Well, I hope we all like surprises, because this morning you are in luck. Because this morning will be a surprise, because we're going back to school. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little equation on the bottom left-hand corner. One banana plus one apple equals... Anyways, it's a profound question. So. And when we're going back to school, specifically, we're going to look at science. See there, you see, you see the sun? It's not quite proportional, but it gives you an idea. The first planet is, is Mercury, and then we have Venus, and then the third one down there is where we reside. And so specifically, I want to examine together the underpinning, the foundation, the certainty of science. Now, why do we want to do that? So, let me give you a shocking statistic. According to the Pew Research Center, 75% of young adults raised in a Christian home, they leave the, the Christian faith when they go to school or to college. So think about it, that is three out of every four of our children. They walk away from the Christian faith. Why? Mainly as a result of some form of intellectual awakening. As is apparent from some of their statements. The first one is, rational thought makes religion go out of the window. Rational thought makes religion out of the window. So, I think the deeper question that should be asked is, in an arbitrary world, a world of random mutations and pure chance, who gave us rational thought? Where, where does that come from? That does not make sense. The second reason that they, most of these young people proclaim is learning all about evolution and the origin of life in college. Learning all about evolution and the origin of life in college. That means that they, the choice they make, they eliminate God by believing everything that we see, that includes you and I, came out of nothing. That is the alternative. And the other reason they offer is that lack of any sort of scientific or specific evidence of a creator. That means they worship science instead of worshiping God. And based on our last worship song, the question is, let's the science reigns our life or does Jesus reigns our life? So, do you realize what is happening to our children and, and to a certain degree to us as well? That our culture has brainwashed, programmed most of us, and including a lot of Christians, that only science deals in hard currency of reality and certainty. And that Christian faith only deals in matter of make-believe, sort of like monopoly money. So that's why our young people exchange their faith for this supposedly certitude of science and of logic and of mathematics. So to have an informed response for our children or grandchildren. Are you listening, grandchildren? Thank you. We must look at this science house of certainty supposedly built on a solid rock. 
And then we will compare that to the Christian solid rock. So join me in a bit of a science exploration tour. And as you can see, so close your eyes, outside I got about 85 camels waiting, so we all gonna mount a camel and I'll take you on an exploration tour. So, so as you can see, this is not for the faint of heart. So put on your thinking cap and hang on for dear life to your camel as we enter the vast, vast desert of science. Now to handle an issue like this, we must first know the correct definitions and the meaning of words. The word science is derived from the Latin verb sire, which means it means to know. And it, the word also shows up in a fancy word omniscient, one of the characters attributed to God. Omniscient means all knowing. But to know should be precisely that. So it's not believing you know, not hoping you know, or voting to know, and it definitely cannot be not knowing. Now, one definition of science is, if an idea is not testable, if it's not repeatable, if it's not observable, and not falsifiable, it is not science. So note that this definition squeezes out God. There's no room for God. Now, philosophically, the def this definition cannot even stand up to its own scrutiny. It self implodes, actually. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. So one of the main pillars of science is it must be observable. Now, we are all familiar with this more contemporary version, seeing is believing. Now, I rearrange these three words into a question. Oh, we got to go back one. Oh, I got to skip the slide. It's seeing, I think there was the slide we started out with. Uh, so, it's seeing this happens to be our morning's title. And, so this is not a coincidence. Now, the story is told about a young university student, he was not Dutch, to make ends meet, he took a part-time job at the local zoo, acting as an anthropoid, you know, an ape. And in this case, he was dressed up in a gorilla suit. He looked pretty real, and as part of his act, he had to escape from his cage through a roof hatch and then continue his monkey business from the top of his cage. So one morning, as usual, he opened the roof hatch and he climbed out and he continued his monkey business from the top of his cage. Now, some bystander, he threw a banana that hit him in the head and he, he staggered back and he fell from the top of his cage right into the lion's den. Screaming at the top of his voice, help, help, I'm not a real gorilla. I'm a nice guy, I even teach Sunday school, help. The lion pounced on him, but instead of ripping his flesh, the lion just hissed at him, shut up you moron, otherwise we both lose our job. Ah, you see what happened. What is observable, even with our own eyes, is not always what it appears. So, beware of seeing is believing. Also, any magician will confirm this. Now, to find the starting point of science, we must go back some 2400 years to the genius of that time, Aristotle. He was one of Plato's students, and Plato believed that man had a soul and therefore had a deeper meaning. Now, Aristotle rejected that idea, and he believed the physical world is all there is. It's our current materialistic 
and philosophy. Thus, there's no soul. And Aristotle thought that the way to gain knowledge was through natural philosophy, just our five senses, whatever we see, feel, hear, and sense. So the work of Aristotle covered a host of subjects. He, he taught logic, music, theater, physics, poetry, politics, biology, ethics, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he was the founding figure of Western philosophy. And he held that position till about the 18th century, not himself, of course, but his philosophy, right? But regarding science, he taught that all matter consists of only four elements, water, soil, air, and fire. So basically, the science he taught was completely wrong. It was haywire. Now, you can't blame him because he operated in the dark. We now have the advantage of looking back at multitude of revisions over those 2,500 years. You see, science is continually revised. What is considered true now will no longer be true not even 20 years from now, but definitely not 100 years from now. And that's the reason why I believe that science will never be settled. And science will always remain in an ongoing state of flux, ever changing. Therefore, science should not reign in our lives because it doesn't know where it's going. Only Jesus knows where he's going. Now, let me unpack and clarify that statement of the this, this science. By looking at something that we're all very familiar with, such as gravity. Now, I happen to know a little bit about gravity because all my professional life I deal with gravity to ensure that steel structures don't collapse under gravity loads. And gravity, it is everywhere. Imagine if gravity would be random then people would pop off their chair at random. That's what that would mean. It's a good thing there's gravity because we ha have something to, to stand on, that we are pulled down. And surely after 2,500 years since Aristotle, you would say we would know all about gravity. Well, we don't. And you don't have to take my word for it. Because this is how an astrophysics professor recently summarized it. We speak of gravity as a force, as defined by Isaac Newton. And more accurately, it is a feature of space-time, as defined by Albert Einstein. Even more accurately, get this, this is from this astrophysics professor. We don't know what it is. We don't know. Did you get that? What a confession. There is no certainty. So what is the issue? Well, it's not just one issue. There are multiple issues. And let's take a closer look. Gravity is bewildering. It is the weakest of the four known natural forces. And a billion times weaker than atomic or nuclear forces. Where you have a weak force and a strong force to hold the atoms together. And it's, but it is the most relentless gravity and unstoppable. It always attracts. It cannot be turned off. And anti-gravity or gravity shields only exist in science fiction. Now, Isaac Newton, he showed up on the stage of history about 1700. He was the first person who discovered not what gravity was, but how it behaves. And his eloquent, yet rather simple formula appears to work accurately on Earth and even within our, most of our solar system. And it allows us to determine the gravitational force between two masses. And it's that force that holds us down. It's our weight. Our mass versus the mass of the entire Earth. So, for instance, the speed to require, if, we, if, I had, if I could jump up, 
I have to reach a speed of 11.2 kilometers per second. So if you go that by hour, that is for about 40,000 kilometers an hour. That is certainly a speed worth a speed ticket, isn't it? If you do that speed, there's uh, she recently got a speeding ticket because she did 50 in a 30 kilometer zone. That's her. But so for me to escape the earth, I have to do 40,000 kilometers an hour. And that's any rocket would have to have that speed in order to blast off to anywhere. But even Mr. Newton, he did not know what gravity was. He wrote, gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws, but whether this agent to be material or immaterial, I have left to the consideration of my readers. So in other words, he said, I've got no clue, boys. Your guess is as good as mine. I do not know. So I'm, he could not explain what it was. He only knew how it behaves. So now let's fast forward from Isaac Newton's time to Albert Einstein. He has a sense of humor, this, this gentleman. So now we're into 1915. And he offered his explanation of gravity known as the general theory of relativity. Well, if you thought the book of Revelation is difficult to understand, the math that Mr. Einstein used is so far out. Get this, it took him 10 years, 10 years to work out that math. And it still perplexes even the best mathematical brains today. And I'm not one of those, just for the record. Thankfully, Einstein's concept of gravity is not too difficult to understand. Now, you're all brave, you'll be riding a camel, so certainly you should be able to follow this. So, imagine a king-size, super soft mattress. Not a normal king-size, but a super, super size mattress. So super size, you cannot see the end of it, you cannot see the width of it, that direction, neither can you see the depth of that mattress. And the mattress is made of space-time fabric, sort of elastic ribbons like a trampoline. Now, imagine that you are smack in the middle of this mattress, all by yourself, with a remote control, some old Dutch potato chips, the plane, I don't do vinegar stuff, just own plane, you know. That's good. And you're doing what else? You're watching a soccer game, right? Now, I hope you're still with me. Don't fall asleep. I know the mattress is very tempting, but. Now imagine, surprise, a fully mature male African elephant. I didn't want to say female, it might insult the ladies, but. A heavy male African, a big dude. He tries to snuggle up right next to you. So what do you think will happen? You get the picture. According to Mr. Einstein, the mass of the elephant will create a large bowl-shaped depression in that mattress, right? And everything right next to the elephant, will be drawn, will fall into that depression. That including you, including your chips, including the remote control. Now, you can keep that picture. Now instead of the elephant, substitute the planet Earth. You see that depression? Well, according to Mr. Einstein, gravity is the bending, so that ball-shaped Depression there is the bending of space and time. Now, note that Mr. Einstein did not know either what gravity was. He only realizes that it behaves way more complicated than anyone had ever imagined. Now, I just stay with the numbers a little bit here. Remember the escape velocity? We were talking about the 11.2 kilometers per second. Well, 
based on Einstein's theory, if the mass of the Earth, so the, the total weight of the Earth, which happens to be about six trillion tons, that is 6,000 times 10 to the 21th power. Anyway, a massive number. So imagine this entire ball of Earth, including us, the chairs, everything. If that gets, if we could squeeze that to a tiny ball, it's keeping the weight the same, right? It's like, like, a, like a bun, you can squeeze it to a tiny little, tiny little ball. But suppose if we could squeeze that to about this size, 8.7 millimeters, then the velocity to escape would be, instead of the 11.2, it becomes 300,000 kilometers per second, which happens to be the speed of light. Now, surely, Henny, how can that be? The, the entire world, how can we squeeze that to a tiny ball, 8.7? But you see, the mass, the fact is that mass, mass is something that you can weigh, right? Stuff that we can weigh. It's made up of, of molecules, and molecules in turn are made of, of, of atoms. But atoms mainly consist of space. Now, we all have been, I think most of us are familiar with the, the, the BC Place Stadium. All of us, raise your hand if you've been inside. Yeah, most of us, right? It, it's, it's, it's massive, right? So to give you an idea of, of, of the space within an atom, and that's only a tiny little thing, or you can't see, but the relation between space and the matter is something like, figure you right inside BC Play Stadium, and right in center field, right in the middle, there is a bee. A bee. <laughs> One of those guys, right? <laughs> a bumblebee. So, that represents the core of an atom, that bee. And the entire space of BC Place represents the space of an atom. And then there's about, depending on how many electrons there are, there's some fruit flies buzzing around in the upper deck. So you see, it, 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 it is all space made of, it's, you, you, it's, no human mind can even get there, understand how the things we, we think are solid. It's mainly all space. So, okay, so we go back to, so I think it is academic, theoretically possible to, so let's squeeze it. So, if the earth is squeezed down, now we all squeeze down, including our camels, we're down to this side, all of us together, we're all wrapped up in this thing. Light can no longer escape. So if you drop that little ball on top of that major mattress that we were talking about, it will fall right through the mattress. And then we're ending up with a black hole. Now, why is it called a black hole? Because we haven't got a clue. That's why we use the word black. We know it's a hole, or we think it is, but we have to call it black, so hang on to that. And these black holes are only a small example of gravity's hidden secrets. And experts believe that our universe is like Swiss cheese. It's riddled with black holes. And that's, not, that's only an opinion, folks. But please stay with me a bit longer because now it gets interesting. Now we get to the real smoke and mirrors. So now based on the discrepancy between observation and calculations of the spin of the galaxies, by the way, Planet Earth, you see in that picture, we are part of a galaxy, that, galaxy that's called the Milky Way. And in the universe, there are a gazillion of those galaxies. We are one of the, the smallest ones. So based on the discrepancy between what we can see and what can be calculated, there appears to be a lot of mass missing. That leads to the following implications in the scientific world. Either Einstein's theory of gravity is wrong, or there must be a lot of unseen mystery mass. This was a tough choice for the scientific community. But today, the astronomers, get this, they have decided 
Yes, they have decided. They believe that the universe is full of this invisible mystery material, and they're calling it dark matter. See, black hole, dark matter. See, they seem to see the first word, you know. They haven't got a clue what's going on. So, but also notice the, the rather unscientific wrangling that science is no longer knowing, rather it is apparent, determined by a majority vote. And also believe, because they believe. So faith has snuck in, not faith in God, no, no. Faith in their own knowing. In December 1998, not too long ago, a team of astrophysics announced based on observations that the universe was not only expanding, but accelerating. You, you have to think in, of, in, in terms of a universe like a balloon that gets sort of blown up and there's all galaxies on the outside. And as that balloon expands, the, the galaxies move away from one another. But this doesn't happen at a constant speed. It gets accelerated as if someone is pumping more air all the time in that, at a very faster pace than initially. If uh, you ever blown up a balloon, well, the first thing goes easy, right? And after you be sucking air, you turn pale and faint, and then, <laughs> but this is, is exponentially bigger. So, to what energy is, who is blowing up this universe? Who's blowing at that balloon? They don't know. But the scientific community agreed on a name. And you guessed it. It's called dark energy. And I'm, folks, I'm not making this stuff up. And it even gets better. Get a load of this. In order to balance out what is observed, and what is calculated, our universe must consist of 20% of dark matter and 68% of dark energy. Neither is observable, neither do we know what it is. But that only leaves us 5% of the entire universe that is visible to us and of which of that 5% we only have a fraction of knowledge. So, if someone tells me science, the certitude of science, because 95% we cannot even see. That means our scientific community is legally blind. Neither do we know what the stuff is. So, talking about being in the dark. To sum it up, we have black holes. We have dark matter. We have dark energy, and who knows what else is lurking in the dark. And it seems to me the more we learn, the darker the picture becomes. Talking about uncertainty. That is not sire, that is not knowing. The more appropriate Latin word would be estimo, from which we get our word estimating or guesswork. And of course, the scientific community will not surrender they defiantly proclaim, but we have our math, medical as proof. But this only has, this has become a problem also. Today, mathematical proofs are long and complex, routinely written on hundreds of densely written pages that requires years of checking by very expert arbiters. Kevin Keith Deflin, a mathematician from the University of Stanford, describes it, this problem this way. This is his word. I think that we now inescapable in an age where the large statements of mathematics are so complex that we may never know for sure whether they are true or false. So did you get that? Even mathematics is relegated to the dark world of, un of uncertainty. Now, the scientific community is not down for the count. They play another trump card. We can surely rely on our rational thought and logic as our rock of proof. 
Bertrand Russell, a mathematician and English philosopher, showed a defect. Actually, he was an atheist. Showed a defect in logic itself, an inconsistency known as the liar's paradox, identified in the following sentence. If I say this statement is true, if this claim is true, if it is true, it's false. And if it's false, it's true. This is an unacceptable paradox in philosophy. And with that inconsistently, you can prove that zero equals one. And philosophy and logic reduced stature received another setback in 1950 with the discovery by a mathematician, logician, Kurt Gödel. With his incompleteness theorem and simple language, he logically proved there will always be subjective truth that we cannot prove using logic. Well, goodbye absolutes and hello relativism. That's where we find ourselves. Goodbye black and white and hello 50 shades of gray. Goodbye male and female and hello, I think the latest count is 51 gender smorgasbord. Now, instead of gravity, I could have drilled down on many other subjects, such as magnetism, electricity, turbulence, the weak or the strong force, etc. The list is endless, and I have not even tackled the soft sciences. So that science house of certainty is not built on solid rock. Instead of most of this house is built on quicksand. And the, and the Bible reminds us, I spoke on that last time, that when something is built on quicksand, the rain came down. And the streams rose. And the winds blew and beat against this house. And it fell with a great crash. So let me sum it up for our culture bullies. If they try to bully you to submit to their claim that science is built on the solid foundation of facts and firmly anchored by mathematics and logic, well, beware. Because that looks exactly like our student in a gorilla suit. Now, I know this gravity has taken up a lot of our time, but now it's time to turn to our Bible. So, Please listen closely here, because here are this morning's three main points. Number one, our world is obsessed, obsessed with the visual. Seeing is believing, but what is God's take on that? Well, let's turn to our scripture. S scripture is 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Is this first telling us, is seeing believing? So look at these guys, you see that? Who sees four sticks? Raise your hand if you see four sticks. Raise your hand who has three sticks. What's wrong with you folks, right? <laughs> it's only a matter of perspective, isn't it? You see it with your own eyes. How can someone see four and another one three, right? Okay. Yeah, you explain it to him. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so everything we see is only a perspective, it's not truth. Are you ready, Mrs. Moore? Thank you. So God is telling us, it is not seeing as believing, rather it's the other way around. Believing, now you can see, now you can see. Now, does that mean that we should not pursue any scientific word? Of course not, I love science, I love math. And God even challenged us to do so in Proverbs 24. Or pardon me, Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, 
To search out a matter is the glory of a king. So in light of that verse, I see scientific exploration more as a God-ordained scavenger hunt. It's a very enjoyable way to spend time. Jesus states in John 12, verse 46, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus can do away with black holes, dark matter, and dark energy. He can shed light on this stuff as we need it. And it, I think it will remain shrouded in a mystery till we go to glory and then we, we get some more answers. Anyway. But I like the way C.S. Lewis puts it. Listen to this, his word. I believe in Christianity just as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I can see the sun, but because by it I can see everything else. Did you get that? It's a profound statement. I believe in Christianity just as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I can see the sun, but because by it, by the light of the sun, I can things make sense and I can see things. Thus, we ought to explore all the sciences by the light of Jesus. And if we don't do that, we will remain groping in darkness, surrounded by quicksand. And Scripture warns us there as well in, in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, the God of this age, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. My second point is that wisdom is not obtained by just gathering some secular knowledge. Worldly wisdom, as stated by Aristotle, starts and ends by us, by ourselves. In contrast, God tells us it starts with him and it ends with him. It got nothing to do with us. We are not important. And so he tells us how to obtain wisdom, and that comes from Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Of the Holy One is understanding. God is the Alpha and the Omega. It's all wrapped up. And Scripture also warns us that the pursuit of knowledge cannot be an end in itself. And because even if you are the smartest person in the world and you can fathom all mystery, even if you can explain the black holes, dark energy and dark matter, and you have all the knowledge, but if you do not have the love of God, you are nothing. Exactly that. And what is nothing? Nothing is, someone explained it, is the dreams that stones have. Definition. Nothing is nothing. I mean, in the, in the current scientific world, th there's books written, I get this, there's books written about nothing. <laughs> I it, it, and it befuddles me. Anyway, so much about nothing. <laughs> Worldly knowledge is all about proof. Godly knowledge is about truth. And truth is an exponential higher level than proof. And I showed that science is not really knowing. Well, truth is knowing. And only an all-knowing, an omniscient, here's that fancy word, he knows all. And if you know the truth, Proof becomes obsolete. Did you get that? Think about it. Suppose you are a judge and you have to adjudicate a very complex case. You must listen to endless testimonies, look at exhibits and other evidence, and in order for you to establish proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But you can never be sure 100%. No one cannot be sure. 
But if you know the truth, there's no need to consider any evidence because you know. Of course, it only applies to an all-knowing God. Now, the Bible gives some further insight about the need for proof. And it makes clear that proof has a diminishing effect on faith. That's what Esther read about this morning. It has a diminishing effect on faith. When Jesus talked to Thomas, who needed proof by looking at the scars of Jesus' crucifixion. In John 20, verse 29, Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Us as believers, we are being blessed here. We haven't seen Jesus. We haven't touched the nail scars in his hand. Now, this message was triggered by the fact that young people trade in their faith for the certainty of science. When I came across this statistic of the Pew Research, that, that sort of stirred my heart. Which reminds me, now I, I know you've, you folks will be going through the book of Genesis there, so, of a story of uh, Jacob and Esau, I'm sure you remember it. And when Esau tragically traded his birthright for a bowl of mac soup or something like that. Well, listen closely. Well, similar are rebirth gifts in Jesus Christ that's open to each one of us, every person, is priceless, that gift. And that is our solid rock of certainty. So we must remind ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, that to trade in that right for a bowl, not to trade that in for a bowl of science soup. So let me repeat that last, my last conclusion. That our rebirth gift in Jesus Christ is priceless. It's open to each one. And that is our solid rock of certainty. And we must remind our children, our grandchildren, whoever we in our sphere of influence, that to trade that in for a bowl of science soup is devastating. So let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us your word. Every page points to your son Jesus Christ to allow him to reign in our hearts. Father, we ask that we do not succumb to the influence of our culture where we're being bombarded constantly but that the scientist knows better he discovers this, that and the other thing. Your son Jesus Christ was given to us for all our shortcomings, for all our sin because that sin runs through each of our hearts and science cannot clean our hearts it's only your son Jesus Christ that can do that so father again we want to thank you this morning we thank you for your word we ask that we practice what we heard and what is in your word in our sphere of influence this coming week whoever we come in contact with and we ask your Holy Spirit to, to water those seeds as we plant them among the members we share our faith with. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.